to help you. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, first off, let me thank uh, all of you all that are here today. Uh, this is uh, this is really kind of a bittersweet moment uh, in, in in terms of things, and I, I say that because sometimes using terms like you know happy and some of that uh, are a little bit difficult to apply in cases like this. But the, the bottom line is this is this is a this is a good time. Uh, for us here in Lubbock County and here at the Sheriff's Office and several of these other agencies that are here today. With that, I'd like to take a moment to introduce, and I'm not going to introduce them all by name, um, but just so you know who's kind of filling the backdrop with me here. Uh, we have members both of the current uh, Criminal Investigative Division of the Sheriff's Office. We have both current and former members of the Texas Rangers here. And we also have several of our uh, either current or retired investigators that all participated in this case over this nearly 20 year period. And uh, so it's, it's really important for me to highlight the thousands upon thousands of hours of work that each of these individuals put into bringing this case to a successful conclusion that we're here to talk about today. So let me just kind of get started, you know, in, in it a little bit. I think most of you all have a lot of the core facts as was released uh, and that you all had access through with the probable cause affidavits for the warrants. But we, we go back to July 15, 2003, uh, when the partially nude and deceased body of Cynthia Joanne Palacio was found on County Road 7800 here in Lubbock uh, County. Uh, she was, uh, once uh, autopsy results were completed, uh, it was determined that her, her cause of death was strangulation, or excuse me, asphyxia, uh, due to strangulation. Uh, if you fast forward up a little bit, uh, as this investigation had continued, and there were several, you know, several pieces of evidence that the investigators, rangers, and those participating at the time were able to identify with regard to her body, with regard to substances on her body, on certain items. She only had one clothing item on her, but some jewelry. And uh, needless to say, like I said, all of, this, all of this evidence was taken, it was processed, and we immediately had at least some DNA connection at that point with regard to a potential suspect. Fast forwarding again to January 6, 2020. Our suspect, Andy Castillo, was arrested in Lubbock on various felony offenses by a McLennan County Sheriff's Office detective and members of the Lubbock Police Department. Uh, on that same date, our investigators, uh, excuse me, on that same date, uh, the Lubbock Police Department was able to obtain written consent from Castillo for his DNA, and that officer subsequently uh, obtained a DNA sample. Uh, upon Reviewing that and finally getting that submitted, our investigators on May 13, 2020, were able to obtain a sample of that DNA and get it submitted to the DPS crime lab, who receives a, needs to needs to to receive a lot of uh, uh, credit on this for their ability to get in and identify this particular sample. But this actually gave us, although we had had a CODIS hit uh, from a previous time that uh, Castillo was in our jail from a DNA swab there. This was actually the first evidence we could confirm that was known to come from him specifically. And with the help of the crime lab there at the Department of Public Safety, we were able to confirm uh, that in fact, all of the, the, re the evidence retrieved at the time of her murder uh, was in fact uh, able to tie back to Andy Castillo's DNA. Uh, at this point, like I said, we, we were able to put together the information we needed in order to obtain a, a warrant uh, for murder from Lubbock County District Attorney's Office, who is also represented here today. Uh, thank you for being here, by the way. Uh, and we were able to go ahead and uh, get those charges placed on the individual while he still resides in McLennan County, and he will be extradited to Lubbock as soon as those charges are disposed of. Uh, down there and we can get him back to Lubbock County to answer to this crime. So on that note, again, like I said, I can't underscore enough what a moment like this means, particularly to the individuals that you see not only standing up here with me, but around in this room that participated 
at all different types of levels within this case. Not only for the family is it important that we're able to finally bring uh, to Cynthia's parents, sister, uh, some closure on this case, that we've finally identified the individual who was responsible for her, her death, uh, but also for these individuals, like I said, that spent many, many selfless hours, sleepless nights working on this case. And some of it, and I, I said earlier, take note, some of these individuals are retired now. They had to leave with that unopened bit of business that we can now close out for them as well. So on that note, uh, I will take and try to answer any questions I can. Uh, and if I can't, Lieutenant Castillo is going to be available to try to answer any real specific questions that we can without uh, crossing too far into uh, anything that would interfere with the prosecution of the case. So with that, go ahead, young lady. Uh, let me just say on that particular, we don't have anything yet specific. Now, although there could be some similarities with regard to uh, those, two particular, those two particular homicides, we don't have evidence yet confirming uh, a definite tie there. So when we get that, and if, if we get that, let me rephrase that, if we're able to confirm that through the same type of DNA testing that we were able to do with uh, Ms. Palacio, uh, then we'll be we'll make that announcement and file those charges appropriately. Has the DNA been applied to any other cases? It's current those that's currently being worked on. There is certainly uh, several other possibilities out there, but uh, we'll let the guys that are working on working on those traps now run through those. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, he had a rather extensive. I don't have it in front of me right now. Uh, but he does have a rather extensive history and does have uh, a, a lot of charges regarding violence with women and some of those types of things. So there's certainly some predicating factors in there that I think will be applicable later on down the road. But. Yes, ma'am. And you obtained his DNA on May 13th. Is it typical for it to take, you know, six months or so to, to identify his DNA? A absolutely. You just got to look at the amount of cases that are being filed. And with the particular labs, they are quite frankly, overloaded. And uh, although there's lots of work to try to, to try to help and assist in that, uh, it is not uncommon and it takes us a little bit to get, you know, get those confirmed results. Because again, we're into the, you know, this is the type of stuff that I think greatly enhances the, the D district attorney's office's ability to prosecute, successfully prosecute these cases, because we're in the octrillionth of certainty with regard to those DNA results. And so we'll, we'll certainly allow for that time to to, for them to do what they need to do as thoroughly as they need to do it. Any other questions I can answer? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Yeah, has the family been notified? Yes, absolutely. Uh, our, our current criminal investigators and uh, the lieutenant down there has been uh, working and talking with the family uh, based on all the new information we have now and keeping them apprised of where we are as of this morning. And under what Uh, a lot of that's uh, is actually based in statute, based on the types of charges that are filed against them. That'll uh, give us the allowance to do that in those those particular cases. Otherwise, officers have to you know obtain warrants for uh, you know for those types of things. We refer to those blood, sweat, and tears types of things when when they have a working case and can you know can generate enough probable cause to get there. Yes, ma'am. Don't, I don't know about immediately surrounding Lubbock. Obviously, you know, Waco and McLennan County uh, had, had, had a, quite a bit of interest on him, in him to, to bring him back down there. So we do know he has, he has certainly been involved in some things in other parts of the state. Was Castillo originally a suspect when um, the murder first happened? Uh, I, I don't think so. I don't think he had initially hit, uh, hit, hit the radar screen at that, that point. Any other last questions I can get for y'all? Are there any other cold cases that you're looking for the public health for? Uh, well, we've got quite a few of those, and I can, I can, I can have Lieutenant Castillo cover those with you uh, once we wrap up here. Uh, obviously, any time you get a significant hit like this, uh, you know, one of the primary things they want to do is, is go back and look at other, other cases with, you know, any, any type of uh, uh, evidentiary similarity to them and see if there's you know anything there that we can you know potentially link you know link to a suspect that's capable of doing this this level of a crime so 
Well, guys, if I don't see see any more hands there, I, again, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank everybody that's here today because, again, this is a very, very telling statement. It's why we kind of shudder on the term cold cases. We don't like to ever say they, they're completely cold because somewhere in every agency that's working, particularly with homicide cases and these, these types of things, somebody somewhere is still grinding through and trying to find something see something somebody may have not caught or realized or find a new a new lead to go run down and it's because of that persistence uh, that we're standing here today getting to, to talk about getting this one uh, at least brought to a point of conclusion for everybody and so again the work will continue on the others but nonetheless